Luxury Generation. Brought to you by Celeste. Welcome to Battery Generation, your podcast on electromobility and European battery research. Today, my co-host Leonard is unfortunately not joining, but I have a great guest instead. In our last episode, we have talked about building up a European Gigafactory with sustainably produced green batteries. Today, we're going to talk about charging EV batteries and the specific cell chemistry of silicon-based anodes. But before we start, make sure to subscribe to our channel and ring the bell if you like what you hear. For any questions, please email us. That's hello at batterygeneration.com. Today, it is an honor for me to be interviewing the CEO of the Israeli company Storedot, Dr. Doran Meyerstorff from Tel Aviv, Israel. Good to have you on the show, Dr. Meyerstorff. Hi, thank you. Thank you for having me. Great being here. You are the CEO of Storedot, a developer of lithium-ion batteries for electric vehicles. For a decade now, Storedot has been developing battery technologies using nanomaterials and organic and inorganic compounds that enable ultra-fast charging. Very recently now, you have publicly tested a silicon-based EV battery that charges a full-scale EV battery cell in just 10 minutes. This is outstanding performance data. We have to talk about that, of course. But first of all, please give our listeners an idea. Why is charging actually so important for electric vehicles? And why is it important to quickly charge electric vehicles? Sure. So, you know, an electric vehicle is an amazing thing. You know, it's something that once you get into, whether it's a Tesla or a Volkswagen or uh, a Polestar or a Volvo, it doesn't matter. Once you get into an electric vehicle, you really feel that this is a serious upgrade. Uh, it's like, you know, people move to a, a touch iPhone as opposed to a, a Nokia cell phone, uh, you know, like 20 years ago. So really, uh, why wouldn't you want an electric vehicle? It's quiet, it's efficient, uh, it's, uh, it's even cost effective uh, when you look at the long run in terms of uh, how much money you pay per, per kilometer or mile. So one problem remains, and, and this is the charging and the speed of charging, because if it's inconvenient for you to charge or you get the range anxiety, meaning you're worried about getting stuck on the highway or people also add the charging anxiety that you actually get to a charging station as opposed to a, a petrol station. And there's a long line ahead of, ahead of you and, and it just takes forever. Or you need to just sit two hours and have two lunches before you can go on and, and continue to your destination. So we are here to solve this number one barrier for the adoption of electric vehicle, which is the range anxiety that is translated to the speed of charging. My first question is um, what markets you're aiming at? Is that only automotive or is that also mobile applications? Is that aviation? Is that other markets? So uh, for a startup, it's very important to focus on a market. And we took a strategic decision about two years ago to only do electric vehicles. We have demonstrated the technology in a number of markets. Uh, like drones, uh, power banks, uh, scooters, and the likes. But at the end of the day, where we see the most value and where we can actually be a market maker is in uh, the electric vehicle a market where you know we can actually solve this problem we just described. And therefore, you have um, developed a silicon-based battery. Um, we are going to talk about the cell chemistry in a while. Um, but um, could you tell us, our interested listeners, um, who are your first clients and maybe future clients? So we, we are still not selling. So this is a, a product in development. And we are shipping samples uh, to maybe half a dozen OEMs. And those that we can share that we are working with are those that are already invested in Storedot. And there are five uh, OEMs uh, uh, that include the Daimler and Vinfast and Ola and Polestar and Volvo. Uh, uh, they, so these are the five that were announced, but we have others that are in various uh, stages of, of testing. Um, so that they uh, will most likely be our clients. Mm -hmm. 
there is going to be a PR message, you know, in the following days. Since this podcast will be distributed two weeks later, you can actually talk about Polestar and Volvo just for one minute. So yes, Volvo we already announced a couple of weeks back, but uh, Polestar also joined uh, this round. Uh, and Polestar is very important for us because we are aiming for the high-end market. We are aiming for fast charging batteries that can really uh, be a differentiator for a startup a company like Polestar. Uh, I just saw, by the way, that they are uh, opening a selling uh, station right across the street here in, in Tel Aviv. So they are starting in Israel as well. Uh, this is a, a, an extremely well-designed vehicle. Uh, that fast charging definitely fits uh, within their uh, value proposition. Let's jump now into um, the cell chemistry. First of all, I think uh, we're talking about lithium-ion batteries still and only um, about the anode side that, you know, is being introduced with uh, silicon um, instead of um, graphite or is that kind of mixed on the anode side? So it's a mix, but uh, not a mix with graphite, but some, uh, I would say, uh, forms of carbon that are similar to graphite. This is, you know, the element C, but in different uh, structures or a different configuration of the crystal crystalline structure. So we are optimizing, uh, I would say, a combination or an alloy of uh, silicon and carbon that uh, together enables basically something that uh, really was considered impossible to do is to take a lithium-ion battery and fully charge it in minutes. Uh, you know, for many years, uh, people told me that this would never happen because of the resistance of the graphite and because dendrites and safety issues and so forth. But we actually solved uh, this over the years with the combination of, uh, like you said, the inorganic materials, such as the polymers that we are synthesizing. With the organic uh, materials, there's some small molecules that, that are being uh, done here. And the combination of the nanotechnology of the silicon and the carbon together with the uh, synthesizing the molecules that hold this and protect uh, the active material during charging is actually very unique. And we use also a, a layer of uh, artificial intelligence during our research. We have here six data scientists that are analyzing the vast amount of data that is coming from the thousands of experiments, uh, both here and in China where we produce and analyzes this data and provides some insights about how to improve and uh, to, to make the battery safer and, 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 and lasting longer uh, with the combination of the materials that are proprietary to store them. Mm -hmm. Could you talk about the, uh, the very popular challenges over the years? I mean, you um, have started developing these silicon-based batteries in 2019. Um, The uh, volume of the the volume change of the anode was a problem. Also, the very few cycles that can be achieved with a silicon-based uh, battery were, you know, the problem. Um, how did you solve that, and how much effort did that take? So the number one problem, like you say, is the swelling. Uh, but there are other problems that are maybe a side problems of the fractures and 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 the decomposition of the silicon. So. Uh, What we actually do, first of all, we do a lot of uh, work on the nanoscale elements. So most companies do not even begin to, to deal with this. They just take the silicon as is. It can be micron size, let's say five micron particle. But this is like, uh, you can think about like a big basketball, that when you inflate it, when you uh, inject all the lithium ions inside, it gets bigger and bigger and bigger. Eventually, it's like a big balloon that can detach from the surface of the electrode of the anode and can start roaming uh, around the battery. It can, first of all, it's a safety issue because it can create shorts, but also you lose the energy once it swells and, and detaches. So, the, so instead of this big basketball, let's think about many, many small golf balls. This is the nanoscale balls that we create. Each one of them, when it's being injected or inflated with the ions, It still swells a little bit, it, but, but there's room in the 3D structure, so you won't feel so much the swelling in the overall 3D structure, but there's inside uh, voids that can uh, allow it to swell a little bit. So you have many, many golf balls that are stuck together. They are more firm because they are protected with our organic coating, 
that is proprietary. These are the organic molecules that, that I've mentioned. It sits in like a hosting matrix with some polymer that, that is uh, also uh, enriched with lithium. So it's somewhat conductive. It actually, it's very unique structure that combines the nanotechnology and the organic compounds. And, and this is really, really unique. This is the only way that we have found that we can actually manage the 300% swelling uh, of, the, of the silicon. And now we have under 10% of swelling. So this is really where we wanted to be uh, in that sense. And we do it for a thousand cycles or more. Uh, which was something that also was a huge challenge over the years. Okay, and how many, uh, how much capacity do you lose within these 1,000 cycles? So we, uh, 1,000 cycles is until we reach 80% of the original capacity. And we are starting with 300 uh, watt hour per kilogram, which is really the state of the art today. There are no better batteries than that. So 300 watt hour per kilogram, this we get in slow charging. In fast charging, we actually get 240. So in the 10 minutes, we're getting 240 watt hour per kilogram. And this is what we have recently demonstrated live in the recent uh, EcoMotion show in Israel. It, uh, it was like two weeks ago. I created a huge interest. We had some press release around that. So this was actually a very, very positive uh, announcement. When you ask a battery researcher, for example, here in Germany, um, hey, what do you think about uh, the silicon-based battery from Stordot? They always want to see data. Has this data also been published? Yes, I think we are very unique in that sense that uh, if you look at the recent press releases over the year or two years, we always provide the charts with the real data of the cycling, what happens every cycle, and we provide data on the temperature, and on the pressure and on the uh, swelling and everything, we are very open and exposed to it. Actually, I think it's a very brave thing. You won't find any other uh, company, uh, private or public, that is sharing so much data like Stordot. So we are an open book. Everybody that wants the data, it's available. It's actually in the press release with the charts. Okay, we will uh, provide a link beneath uh, the podcast regarding um, that data um, for this um, very publicly tested um, silicon battery. Um, next question, um, how are these anodes actually produced, Dr. Meyerstorff? How, how do you um, produce so, so this material? We, we took upon ourselves to really design a process that is very traditional. We are trying not to do anything exotic, like let's say if you take a, a solid state batteries, they need a very special separator. You need a whole factory just for the separator. And then you have a process that needs modification in order to use uh, the separator in a battery. So um, uh, these are all added costs and added steps that I'm, I'm not sure are balanced with the benefits that you can get from uh, uh, an exotic process. So our goal, and this is what we've been demonstrated through our partnership and joint venture with EVE Energy, uh, in China, that they are also an investor in Stordot, by the way, uh, that we show that we use the traditional lines as they are, zero changes. We may be, you know, mixing at a higher speed. We may be coating at a thinner electrode. But at the end of the day, these are parameters of a normal process. Uh, so these electrodes are manufactured in a very uh, normal, traditional way. Would you say um, your batteries that are silicon-based are uh, even more sustainable than the traditional lithium-ion batteries consisting of graphite on the anode side? Yes, the whole idea is that silicon, first of all, it has much more energy, maybe like five to seven times more energy than graphite. And this is what enables us to do them uh, thinner electrodes that they hold per gram the same amount of energy. So this is how we reach the 300 watt hour per kilogram uh, and we're enabling the fast charge. But I would say that the, the inherent capabilities of the diffusion of ions into silicon is what enables the fast charge. And this is where we do not get this phenomena of the dendrites. These are like little nails that uh, are, are metal lithium that is growing in, in, uh, in a graphite-based battery and can puncture a hole in the separator and create a, a short circuit and eventually you know, a chain of uh, events that creates fire. These problems do not exist with, with our electrodes. 
the probability of dendrites is very close to zero. And even if we do get a dendrite, it, it being eliminated in the next cycle. So these are very safe batteries for fast charging. That sounds to me as it, it can't be uh, true, you know, it's, it sounds too good to be true. Um, is there even any downside on these um, silicon-based batteries? You've talked about safety now, you talked about sustainability, energy density, performance. What about the price and recycling? Is there any downside within that battery technology? I wouldn't say a downside, but I think we are moving now from an R&D uh, uh, risk that is kind of mostly eliminated to an execution risk and supply chain risk and cost risk. Uh, absolutely. You know, we are dealing with materials. Some of them uh, we buy, some of them we make. Uh, some of them are, are being processed at the facility, uh, like the, na the na a combination of the nanoparticles with the organic materials. This is something that, uh, you know, it took us a while to stabilize uh, at the production line. So uh, definitely we would need to prove that this technology is now scalable and that we can bring it at the right cost that is very similar to a graphite-based battery. And this is the phase that we are currently at. And luckily with the recent round that uh, includes uh, new uh, partners and investors, including the manufacturing facility, uh, this positions us very well to uh, move into this next uh, phase and, and prove that the execution is, is actually uh, cost effective. Let me um, put it in different words. What is the biggest challenge or maybe the parameter that you're most concerned of yet? So I'm most concerned about the supply chain uh, because there's already stress on the supply chain and the manufacturing capacity because of you know the price of lithium and nickel and manganese, these things. Uh, we hardly use cobalt, so that's less of a problem. Uh, but on the cathode side, we are using NMC, nickel, manganese, and some cobalt, uh, uh, 811 in percentage, 80%, 1010. So this is the current technology. We are working on some other flavors that uh, uh, could be LFP or others, but the first generation is an NMC cutter. So I'm worried about the supply chain. And you need to add on that the issue of the nanoparticles that we mentioned that makes it, I would say, even more challenging for a new technology Uh, to ramp up uh, production uh, during very high demand period. This next few years are, go are, are going to be all over demand. You know, there's going to be more demand than what we can supply from any factory. This is why 100 gigafactories would need to be built. This is, uh, you know, Elon Musk has said it even years ago, and he was absolutely right. We are missing huge amount of capacity for batteries, Uh, and this is why many uh, factories are being built. But even, let's say, the 10 or dozen that are being planned right now, it's not enough. We'll need maybe tenfold of these in the next five years in order to uh, keep on the uh, demand for electric vehicles, which is you know, undoubtedly going to be huge uh, uh, over the next years. We have talked about building up a gigafactory uh, in the last episode with Christopher Haugs from Northvolt. Um, we're not talking about building up a gigafactory in Israel, right? So I'm, I, I wonder, um, your company is based in Israel. Um, are you partly moving to Europe one day? So, uh, yeah, you're right. It doesn't make any sense to have a gigafactory in Israel uh, just because of the supply chain issues and, and, and added cost. So we are looking to partner, like the partnerships uh, that we have already in China, we are looking to partner with uh, uh, companies in the US that are building factories and some companies in Europe. Of course, one natural uh, partner would be Northvolt uh, through the joint ventures with the Uh, Polestar with the, with Volvo, uh, both on the R&D side and on the manufacturing side. But, uh, you know, the investment is recent and we are just now uh, establishing uh, these uh, uh, joint ventures. And hopefully uh, Northvolt can be a facility that we can ramp up in. But we are working on five or six others because at, at the end of the day, we want to produce close to where the vehicles are being made. And we have partners, uh, potential customers in the U.S., We have in Italy, uh, we have in Germany, we have in Sweden, we have also in Vietnam, we have now also in India. So in each of these geographies, we want to be able to ramp up uh, this uh, amazing fast charging technology. 
let me move forward now to um, investments and commercialization of uh, your efforts. Um, lately, there are many manufacturers that announced, uh, such as Stordot, to produce silicon-based batteries, for example, Enervate, Amprius, and also Vata from Germany. Uh, how widely do you expect um, these silicon-based batteries anodes to spread within the battery market. So do you think that's going to be a standard in, uh, in a few? So first of all, I want to congratulate everybody that they finally realized that silicon is the route uh, for the next generation batteries. It just proves the point that Stordot uh, was always pushing that, you know, you need to start replacing the graphite just because of the higher energy of the silicon. And the fact that silicon is like the second most abundant element on earth Uh, that, uh, you know, it's, it's available, it's, it, there's no issues with the environment or with uh, metals or whatever. So silicon is great, and I'm happy that there are like five or six companies that are doing silicon. We are the only ones that took the silicon to real fast charging. We call it extreme fast charging, meaning charging in minutes. The rest have taken it more to the energy density, which is great. I mean, we also need energy density. Like I said, we also reached... Uh, the top of the 300 watt hour per kilogram. And by the way, we have some samples here that are showing 330, which is amazing, but I don't want to, you know, really officially announce it until we can demonstrate the data in, in a press release, like we said earlier. But this is coming also. We are showing progress on the, on this front as well. But we have, with the nanotechnology and the organic compounds, we've optimized something that we believe is a game changer. We also have a third-party uh, uh, lab that have verified this for, for uh, doing the due diligence uh, that we have done with these five OEMs recently. So I'm very confident that what we have is very unique, but I'm happy that there are other players in silicon. By the way, Tesla is also using some silicon, uh, not in nanoscale, but they do use it for uh, increased energy. So you know, all the indications show that there's going to be a major shift in the battery production to more and more use of silicon. And we are uh, proud to be in the forefront of, of uh, uh, this research. Wow. You have talked about um, teaming up with uh, Volvo and Northvolt. Um, what are you especially providing um, in that joint venture with these companies? You've talked about some IT and even uh, artificial intelligence uh, components that, are you pro that you're providing. Uh, you want to talk about that? Yeah, so, so first to be just fully transparent, we are not yet in any engagement with Northvolt. Uh, we have only the investment from Volvo, and there is the joint venture between Volvo and, and, uh, and Northvolt. Uh, there are actually two. There's the R&D side and there's the manufacturing side. What we hope to provide uh, in this engagement is, first of all, uh, you know, the groundbreaking technology of the silicon and, and fast charging capabilities for the Northvolt facility, But also we can bring our data science capabilities to the R&D where we have this layer of uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning that collects data from the thousands of experiments and batteries uh, that are being cycled and provides insights because no human can look at these terabytes of data and say, oh, you know, this cell 5,546 is better than 4,426 because it has more I would say, uh, electrolyte or a better concentration of silicon or what have you. No human can do that. But the data science actually brings these capabilities. And this is how we improved over the years. And we've developed, I would say, a very uh, unique and state-of-the-art uh, methodology to use artificial intelligence in the uh, R&D for batteries. And we can also use it also as they move into operation because we collect the data in real time from the field, from the vehicles. Uh, we can actually pinpoint those cells that have maybe some issues with the resistance or health or temperature. We can shut them down or we can recondition them. We have uh, some patterns around that. We call it the self-healing uh, capability of the cells. So, uh, um, and we have some very interesting patterns around that. Uh, so uh, this is something that we can share Uh, with the uh, joint venture uh, with Northvolt and with Volvo and with Polestar and basically bring everybody to the next level. We open these patents, by the way, to the world. We won't charge for this. We are, in that sense, exactly like Tesla. We want to sell uh, the technology of the battery 
and everything that we do in the outer uh, um, ecosystem is something that promotes fast charging as a whole. Mm -hmm. That is so interesting because uh, we've talked about that um, in the last um, podcast. Um, it sounds to me that AI is a uh, topic for the battery management system. And of course, Northvolt, Volvo, and you are, tr are wanting to build that BMS um, for the cell. Who's going to make the race at the end when you're joining up as a team? Uh, there has to be one company that provides AI for that BMS to display the status of the battery. Don't you think that's kind of a, a competition within the development? So as I said, we, we are focused on the chemistry of the battery. Everything else that we provide, we provide it for the greater good and we can provide the algorithms and the know-how and the insights uh, on the batteries. But at the end of the day, we are not making a BMS. We are only providing value that uh, can look at the data Uh, of our cells and, and, and provide insight. We are less interested in providing, you know, just generic BMS for whatever graphite-based batteries. We are looking at the fast charging and the challenges of fast charging, and we want to mitigate those challenges with this uh, layer of AI that uh, we provide basically uh, uh, as a bonus to, to the chemistry of the battery. Let's skip then uh, very briefly to fast charging. Uh, stupid question uh, at that um, point. When charging so quickly, there is huge amounts of electric currents uh, that are very high when charging your electric um, vehicle. How many amperes uh, are we talking there? Is that even possible uh, when, when looking at the electricity grids to uh, charge quickly everywhere? I mean, do we even have... Um, the infrastructure for that uh, fast charging? Yes, yeah, so this, absolutely yes, but these are two different topics. First of all, the power of the charging stations. Yes, we need to, th those to be upgraded to at least 350 kilowatt uh, uh, for, let's say, charging uh, 10 minutes of a Nissan Leaf. Uh, but if it's bigger, let's say a Tesla Model S, you would even need double that, maybe seven, 750 kilowatt. So, The infrastructure for the charging station is being installed uh, and we do see more and more stations that are 350 kilowatt uh, being deployed, which is great for us. The second part of your question is the amps uh, that are required, but it's not so much the amps because it can be a 400 volt system or an 800 volt system. So at the end of the day, it's the power that uh, the kilowatt uh, that, that is interesting because we need to dissipate the heat whether it's you know 300 amps or whether it's 800 amps, we would need to dissipate this heat uh, because uh, at the end of the day, the, like you said, there is a lot of heat being generated uh, uh, during the charging. But you know, luckily for us, the cooling system in the vehicle exists. This is part of you know the operation of the vehicle. When you want to accelerate, let's say you're going, uh, getting out of the red light and you want to reach 100 uh, kilometers per hour in three seconds, let's say like a Tesla, uh, uh, then you need a lot of power and it generates it. And this is why you have cooling in the vehicle, active cooling with liquid. Uh, we would need to use that as well during the charging uh, in order to make sure that we don't go, let's say, above 40, 45 degrees Uh, uh, ambient temperature of the battery uh, and you also need to cool the cable of the charging station and you need to cool the connector so all these are being designed uh, through our partners um, but as I mentioned we cannot solve everybody's problem we are providing the missing piece that was considered impossible to do and this is why the rest of the elements are not in place because uh, nobody believed that you can take a battery and charge it in five minutes Once we show that this is possible, now all the ecosystem is being aligned to uh, enable this great uh, feature for the drivers. It sounds really, uh, everything sounds very interesting. Uh, however, there has been uh, a bit of criticism uh, towards your company. When reading through your company's history, uh, you eventually read also about critical issues, in particular, these marketing texts and, and notes that are stating uh, Storedot has only claimed to have developed all these um, cell technologies, that especially from 2015 to 2020, These texts 
in my opinion, underline that uh, when business and battery technology clash, it eventually gets very uh, difficult. And since battery technology takes time and is dependent on so many issues like markets, like like price and materials, um, yeah, that uh, that is an eventual outcome. Companies like SALD um, and QuantumScape and solid state batteries, they all face these problems as well, what they announce and what actually at the end is delivered. Um, so lo looking back on these years, maybe seven years ago, uh, what do you think about your personal announcements um, about future you know, battery production? Sometimes that didn't become reality. Don't you think um, you should be more careful about promising whatever uh, you're currently developing and you kind of promise the success stories for the future? So first of all, uh, I accept the criticism. Uh, I, I did think that it will be faster uh, to get to market, but uh, it took us a decade to really break these uh, boundaries. Uh, you know, we took the toughest challenge, really. Uh, toughest challenge is when you deal with the materials, with the core materials of the battery and the chemistry, there's no bigger challenge. This is not an application or a software or some engineering challenge. This is really an R&D uh, risky project with a lot of challenges and that it was considered impossible to do. Now, in 2015, I already showed that it is possible. And this is, uh, you know, and everybody told me that this will never happen. You'll never be able to charge in minutes because of A, B, C, and D, temperature, risk, fire, whatever. I said, no, I see in the lab that we can do it and we will deliver. And at the time, I thought we would start with smartphones because this was like everybody were looking for an outlet, you know, in the in airports to charge their phones. You don't see this problem anymore today. So this is so this is one of the reasons I moved away from the previous generation and moved only to silicon with uh, electric vehicles. Now, yes, it took us a decade. But we have solved the number one problem of humanity with energy. This is the number one problem because, you know, in the past, the problem of humanity, let's say 50 years ago, was how to generate electricity, how, how you create the energy. Uh, and people started, you know, burning oil and gas and coal and all that. Today, this problem is, is, is less of an issue because you have all the alternative energy. You have, you have uh, nuclear, you have geothermal, but mostly you have solar and wind. This is solved. Now the question is, how do you take all this energy and make it available where you need it, when you need it? This was, you know, so this is batteries. So batteries is the new oil. Now creating a new battery is a huge challenge that we have taken upon ourselves. And luckily we had enough supporters because we have shown enough progress over the years, starting from Samsung and TDK and then Daimler. And, and today we have over, you know, a hundred I, I, this, I'll tell you a secret. I have 120 companies that invested in Stordot uh, because we are basically breaking the, the rules of what was known to be possible. Once more, the question, uh, don't you think battery technology and and uh, and business is kind of like a clash? You have announced a couple of years ago millions of cars to be equipped with your uh, um, EV battery by 2020, so that didn't happen. Don't you think sometimes you need marketing in order to kind of, um, you know, get investors uh, and in order to develop your dream? Uh, on the other hand, you have to kind of, um, kind of look in the glass ball and, and announce something you don't know for sure. Because we have, um, I, I can tell you also from the uh, from the um, German battery institutes, um, we have faced many skeptical um, Uh, voices that uh, always said, you know, I told you that didn't happen. I told you it was going to fail anyways. So again, the question from your experience, is that a mistake to announce something from the R&D side that probably is a risk of happening at the end? So, you know, Elon Musk is trying to get to Mars, right? He's saying we need to move all humanity to Mars. And he said it will happen within a decade or two, right? The probability or the likelihood of that is far from 100%. But he's saying this with a, with a, a full confidence. Why is he doing that? Because that's the only way to shift people's mindset that the impossible is possible to do. Now, at the time, I was fully authentic because I had companies like Daimler that uh, were looking at the technology and said, you know, if, if this passes all these uh, criteria, we'll put it in the, in the cars. 
But this is a moving target because at the time, some other companies came with better energy with graphite. So the project was delayed. So when I present some timeline, this is when I'm fully authentic about what I believe we can achieve. Now, the fact that it takes longer sometimes, yes, it takes longer. This is not marketing. This is putting the vision in place and getting everybody aligned. Everybody, I'm saying you investors and the overall community of technology. It's always easy to say, oh, this is bullshit. This will never happen. But this is the easy thing. The hard thing to say is, yes, it will happen and we will make it happen. And we'll make it happen first before everybody else. And this is what Stordot has been doing over the last 10 years. And we have been successful. And this is just because we hold the vision. We demonstrate the numbers. We, we always put uh, full tra- uh, transparency to what we have already achieved, which is, by the way, far beyond what com- other companies that are public and are worth billions, many billions, are showing. We are showing much better results. But, um, you know, we, we are brave in, in, doing, in doing so. We are an open book to everybody to see what we have. And what we have is actually amazing. And this is why we get all these investors coming. Thank you so much, Dr. Maestro, for your time. That was very impressive and a very visionary talk. I think it's great to have some sort of a, you know, science pitch here as well, because you've talked about the, the frame we're in here, and it is definitely worth of developing new battery technology. Thank you very much for that talk. Thank you. Thank you for the, uh, I would say, strong questions. We need those as well. Dear listeners, if you like what you heard, uh, please subscribe and give us a five-star rating in your podcast app or just leave a comment below this podcast. That's it for today. And for next time, click in, tune in and stay charged. Bye-bye.